Okay, so we're going to begin our last and final unit. And um, this unit, uh, I'm not going to call it a throwaway unit because there is some important stuff in here. But in terms of kind of the hierarchy of things that we might see on the final exam, this one's going to be really low. Um, this is going to be a lot more applicable. So if you are kind of looking at things as a potential chemistry major or somebody who is kind of looking more out on the horizon of, you know, geosciences or, you know, things where we might be a little bit more interested in the solid state and kind of how things are put together. This stuff's a little bit more relevant to you. Uh, so really what we're going to be looking at in this chapter is we're going to be looking at structurally what does the solid state look like? So we know from a molecular standpoint that solids generally have molecules or atoms that are really close together. And we know that there's a rigidity in them and that's why they have high density. But beyond that, we really don't, we haven't talked a whole lot about that. We've talked a lot more about what happens inside of a liquid, what happens inside of a solution, how gases have nothing to do with each other unless we really compress them considerably. But what about solids? And so we're going to start by actually talking about a technique that is used to help characterize solids. It's called X-ray diffraction or X-ray crystallography. And what it allows us to do is it allows us to shoot light, high speed, high frequency light, X-rays, into a solid material. And based upon how that light interacts with the material, how it bends, how it diffracts, how it scatters, we can get an idea of what the structural integrity, what the structural components of that crystal are. And so the technique gets kind of complicated quickly. So we're going to generally avoid that conversation as much as possible. But what we can understand is that the atoms that make up the solid are going to form these layers on top of each other. And to the X-ray diffraction, we call those atomic planes. And what we can see is that as we introduce these rays of light from the X-rays coming in, we will be able to see that there will be a difference in terms of the way that those light beams bend the way the angles that they come off change based upon the atomic planes, how many atomic planes that they go through. And so we can do some calculations based off of that that will give us some ideas about half length, diameter of the atom, those kinds of things. And so what it actually looks like is kind of interesting because this is more or less what the experiment looks like. It's, it's, it's a classic, um, very similar to what we see in spectrophotometry. We've got a source of light. We filter that source to a confined area to beam it into the sample and the sample then does something with it. Now in spectrophotometry, all we were looking at was the difference between how much light went into the sample versus how much light came out of the sample. And we use that to figure out absorbance. Here, there is no real detector for the light other than we're looking to see how is that light diffracted. So Imagine, if you will, 
We did some similar things when we first talked about electrons way back in chapter three. The idea of that, you know, interference pattern. You know, take a spray bottle, hold it out and spray it. And where does that mist go? Well, what we're seeing here is kind of a similar idea, not in terms of the, the mechanism, but what the pattern looks like. It looks like a starburst. All of the x-rays are kind of split out and they're largely split out based upon what happened to the light. Did the light pass straight through? If it did, that's the middle part right here. If it didn't, how did it diffract? How did it split? Did it bend this way or did it bend that way? And so to the crystallographer, that actually means something and they can do some calculations based off of it. Now for us, we're gonna kind of, again, we're gonna steer away from that particular conversation and talk more fundamentally about what the whole thing means. What the crystallography can do for us ultimately is it can give us a pattern. It can tell us how the atoms in that substance are arranged relative to each other. And we call that arrangement of those atoms the crystal lattice. Crystal because that is what the solid arranges itself as. That is its repeating pattern. And lattice because, well, that's kind of what it looks like. And inside of that crystal lattice, we can break down the appearance of that crystal into a single repeating unit. And we call that single repeating unit a unit cell. So kind of in the same way that we can take a sample of water and break it down into, okay, this big sample of water breaks down to individual molecules of H2O. That at the molecular level for other phases is kind of the idea of the unit cell in the solid phase. If I break down this crystal lattice, which has atoms going in every direction, that single repeating unit is the thing that it breaks down into. That is our unit cell. This crystal lattice is millions upon millions upon millions of these unit cells arranged three-dimensionally in all directions. Now, unit cells can be classified in a number of different ways. Primarily, we look at them in terms of their symmetry. Now, you guys did the sulfur lab last semester, right? You looked in the microscope and you saw the different sulfur crystals. We had the ones that looked like needles and the ones that were kind of big and blocky. Okay. Yeah. No one knows what I'm talking about. Uh, well, in that particular lab, that is one of the labs that we can do for Chem 105. Some semesters we've done it, some semesters we've had to cut it. Um, for, for time reasons, just because of the way that the schedule worked. But a lot of the time when we look at those, that's exactly one of the things that we're looking for. There's a difference between those monoclinic crystals, which kind of have a needle-like appearance, and those rhombic crystals that have a, a larger kind of uh, bulky shape appearance to them. The shape that we get in the symmetry that we get in those crystals has a lot to do with how they are arranged, how they are packed together. And so we generally can see that there are you know, two or three primary ways that we can pack these solid items on top of each other. And which pattern they use 
largely depends upon the size of the atom themselves. The bigger the atoms are, the more space they're going to need when they stack on top of each other. And so if we have something that is going to use, you know, smaller holes, like this one here, not every atom might be able to utilize that. Not every atom might be able to fit into that state, that space properly. So there are some differences. So there is a stacking pattern where we literally just line them up one row after another, after another, all directly on top of each other. That stacking pattern is called AAA. Every single row is identical to the one above it and below it. Now, we tend to see that with the larger kinds of atoms and ions because it's not very efficient. We can see layering like this top line here, where if we have something a little bit smaller, we could have a layer A and a layer B, and then layer A again, and notice that layer A is in the exact same positions as layer A was two rows below it. So this is a little bit better efficiency in terms of packing because we're finding ways to utilize some of the spaces in between. A more efficient way still would be if we could find a way to use even smaller spaces in between like this pattern. This is the ABC pattern where we've got one row, we've got another row that fits into the small spaces between the holes in row A, and we've got a third row that fits in the small spaces between row B. Now, there's a, another way of doing it. This is called hexagonal close packing, where instead of making arrangements that are more cubic-like, because the ones that we just saw were more cubic kinds of arrangements, these ones are a little bit more like hexagons. And so what we have is we have a ring that is six-sided, so six atoms in a ring, with a seventh atom in the middle, that's our hexagon. And we fit in between those hexagons small numbers of other atoms in the spaces in between. So inside of each one of those unit cells, we have two of those seven atom hexagons, and we have a three atom triangle in between the two hexagons. And as you might imagine, this packs together pretty efficiently. So this is an AB pattern, AB, 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 AB. Similar to this AB pattern here, and we get some pretty good packing as a result. Now, when it comes to unit cells, there are a couple of terms that we associate with the unit cell. One of them is something called coordination number. Coordination number is basically how many other atoms is each atom touching? How many other atoms is each atom touching? That's the, that's the key question when we are looking at unit cells, when we're trying to figure out coordination number. Now, 
understand that unit cells apply not only to pure solids, but because ionic crystals mimic pure solids, we can see them in ionic solids as well. If we are looking at an ionic solid, coordination number doesn't become the matter of how many other ions is it touching, but rather how many ions of the opposite charge is it touching. So if I've got a lattice of chloride ions and sodium is kind of inserting itself into the structure, the coordination number for the sodium would be how many chlorides does it touch? The general rule of thumb with coordination number is that the larger the coordination number is, the more efficiently it is all packed together and the larger this, the intermolecular forces are going to be. And this should make sense, right? Strong intermolecular forces come from close interaction. Close interaction comes from things touching each other usually. Closer they can get together, the more attracted to each other they're gonna become, the more it's gonna affect their physical properties like melting point. Closely related to that idea is something called packing efficiency. Packing efficiency says, let's take a look at this unit cell. How much of that unit cell is actually occupied with the atom in question versus how much of it is empty space? The higher the coordination number is, the better the efficiency of packing is going to be. Because you're going to get higher coordination numbers, you're going to get more stuff packed into that unit cell, you're going to have less empty space. So there is a calculation associated with this. We're not going to get too deep into the numbers of it, um, just because you're not going to be asked to calculate this too often. But just understand, when we are given a packing efficiency number, this is what it is referring to. So if we say that a particular unit cell has a 79% packing efficiency, well, what that means is that only 21% of its unit cell is empty space. The other 79% is filled with whatever that substance is. So for the most part, we are going to focus on cubic unit cells. One of the reasons we're going to focus on the cubic unit cell is because it is kind of easy to conceptualize. It is easy to see. Um, we can do some relatively simple calculations off of it. And it doesn't get too complex with getting into algebra and trigonometry to do some of the calculations associated with it. Unlike hexagonal, which can be a lot more, you know, hexagonal close packing is very efficient, it's not nearly as common, and the calculations associated with it are a little more on the bothersome side because we are not dealing with a square or a cube. With cubes, we've got right angles, we've got um, some pretty basic algebra geometry kinds of calculations that we can do. So we're going to start with simple cubic. Simple cubic is going to be featured because it's, it's the easiest. Um, it, so that's the first one we're going to look at. From a standpoint of packing, we're talking about that AAAA pattern. Every layer of a simple cubic is just lined up directly on top of the layer in front of it and on directly on the layer below it. We're not trying to fit into any holes. We're not trying to get into deeper, more efficient packing. 
the size of the ion or the molecule itself is going to largely prevent that. So they just stack on top of each other very simply. And as a result, their unit cell is very simplistic as well. It's just a cell We've got ourselves a simple eight corner box. Easy to see, easy to visualize, simple. Not terribly efficient in packing, but easy to put our brains around. There is a second type called a body-centered cubic cell. And this one is relatively simple as well. This follows an AB pattern. So like the simple cubic, you can see we've got an array of, of yellow spheres, and then we've got some purple spheres that are fitting in between each one. So I'm going to attempt to kind of show if this is a layer. And I could have drawn that a little better. If this is a layer in the cubic cell, all that a body-centered cubic does is it introduces an atom into that hole right there. And so if I put that there and then I stack the next layer on top of that, what I would see is that I've basically got a simple cubic design with an extra atom stuck in the middle. So the stacking pattern here is AB. What we're talking about here is filling something called a cubic hole. Just a hole right in the middle of the cube. So certainly we're going to get a better packing efficiency here than what we did in the simple cubic. Because instead of having empty space in the middle of the cube like we did in the simple, we've got another atom in there. And don't be fooled by the drawing here. The drawing here is kind of taking that and stretching it out diagonally understand it's it's more like this and since it's more like this here what we're really talking about ultimately is that those atoms are all touching each other so what i have is a straight line from the atom in the bottom left corner to the atom in the top right corner going straight through the entire diameter of that body atom. Now, the reason we make mention of that is we're gonna do some calculations with this material here. And that geometry is gonna be important to us because basically all the calculations that we have in unit cells all center around right angle geometry in right triangles. So if you ever wonder to yourself, when am I going to use the Pythagorean theorem? Today's the day. So we're gonna log that. That's gonna become important to us 
in a little bit. Now, when we have a cubic unit cell that is going through and packing the most efficiently as possible, we call that cubic close packed. And the arrangement of cubic close packed is an ABC arrangement, just like what we saw for hexagonal packing. Hexagonal packing, you could have the AB pattern, or if we had something small enough, we could have that ABC pattern where we had those red spheres in the middle as well. Notice that for cubic close packing, uh, the yellow balls here represent the A, the blue and the red represent B and C. And you can see that what you have here is basically we've got two triangles that are inverted to each other. And so the one triangle is filling the holes of the second triangle. And then what the yellow balls here are, they are filling these tetrahedral holes right in the middle of that triangle arrangement. And so where this can be kind of hard for us to visualize is the close packing, the cubic part of that is not if we look at the cell vertically like this, but rather if we look at it diagonally like that. And the other confusing part to this pattern here is that those are all the same atom. Now we colored them differently so that you could see the different layers. But in the end here, what we are talking about is the same atom filling out that space. And so what this gives us is if I uh, attempt to at least recreate part of it, this gives us a pattern where each face of our unit cell looks like it's a number five on a die. So if you ever play Yahtzee and you roll fives, that arrangement of those pips, that five point arrangement is kind of the same thing as what's going on in this unit cell. On the unit cell, you've got five atoms in each face that are touching each other. We call this arrangement face-centered cubic. So body-centered cubic was called that because inside the body of that unit cell, we had an atom that was trapped. Here we have on each face, of the cube, an atom that is centered on it. Not completely trapped by it, but centered on it. And that's why it's called face-centered cubic. This represents the best means to pack a unit cell that is a cubic shape. Now, like I said, there are other shapes that are not cubic. We talked about hexagonal close packing. There are others that are, you know, more rectangular, more rhombic, that have less symmetry. We're ignoring those for the most part because once we start to get into asymmetrical stuff, it gets way complicated fast. And the good news for us is that a good chunk of our solid state materials fall into one of these cubic kinds of patterns. So if we look at the three cubic unit cells side by side by side here, 
what we will notice is that there are some commonalities to them. So one of the commonalities to them is that they always do have those eight atoms on the corners. That's what makes them cubic in the first place. What they also tell us is there are different ways that we can look at measuring distances based upon how they are touching each other. So in a simple cubic, all of the atoms are touching each other only along the edges of the cube itself. This atom on this corner isn't touching this atom on the other corner. The atoms are only touching each other along straight line planes, vertically and horizontally, never diagonally. For face-centered, we can see that the atoms will touch each other through a diagonal line inside of the um, inside of the uh, face itself. They do not touch each other vertically. They do not touch each other horizontally. So they will touch each other here and really here only. In body centered, notice that they do not touch each other horizontally. They do not touch each other vertically. They only touch each other through that diagonal axis that goes through the middle of the unit cell. And again, these distinctions are important because for the small amounts of calculations that we are going to do with these kinds of data, this is the stuff that's going to be distinctive and allow us to make the right calculation at the right time. So with that in mind, there is one thing that uh, uh, crystallography can give us that will help considerably. It's something called the edge length. The edge length of the unit cell is given to us by the letter L. And we're using a script L here. so that it does not get confused with the number one or um, with you know, phases of matter or anything else like that. So in a simple cubic cell, what we can see is that because they are touching each other here, the edge length is equal to two times the radius of the atom itself. Because if I'm going from measurement of radius, meaning start at the nucleus, go out to the last electron. Well, since the two are touching each other, if I was covering the whole thing, the whole edge, which I'm not, um, what I have to realize well, I have to understand, and I'm actually going to jump ahead just a minute here because this is going to help with the visualization there. When I look at a unit cell, I have to understand that the atom in that unit cell is not unique to just that cell. This is part of a lattice. This is part of an array. The atoms that are sitting on the corners are also sitting on the corners of a bunch of other unit cells as well. 
In fact, for the corners, each one of those corners is sitting in eight unique unit cells. It represents the top right corner in the unit cell that we might be looking at, but it also would be the top left corner in another, the top, uh, the bottom left corner in another, and the bottom right corner in another. And take it upstairs to the next layer above it, we'd see the same thing. So each corner atom is giving us, is part of eight different unit cells. So if we are looking at its participation in our unit cell, we would say that that corner cell, that corner atom is one eighth of an atom because that one atom is shared over eight different unit cells. So this probably gives a better picture than what I was trying to describe. If I look at this atom here in this corner of the unit cell, on a unit cell, we might see it depicted like this and be tempted to think that this atom right here is part of this unit cell and this unit cell only. But if we think about it three-dimensionally, this atom right here is part of eight different unit cells. And so as a result, we only consider its contribution to the unit cell as one eighth of an atom. And so what that means for our unit, our cubic unit cells, since there are eight corners, each one of those co corners contributing one eighth of an atom, at minimum, the number of atoms in a unit cell is one. So if I have a simple cubic cell where all I have are the atoms on the corners, eight corners times one eighth of an atom each, one atom in the unit cell in total. Now, if I have something that is face centered, we would see that that face is shared by two unique unit cells. So any atom on the face of a cube would be worth one half. If I had something that was body centered, Well, that is completely encapsulated by the corner atoms. So it is only for that one unit cell. So it counts as a whole atom. If I have an atom on an edge, which we haven't talked about yet, but will come in handy, especially if we're talking when we get into ionic crystals, especially that edge would be part of four unit cells. So any atom on the edge would be worth one quarter. So again, coming back to why is this relevant? Well, now we look at from the standpoint of our edge length, why are we only counting a portion of these corner atoms as part of the edge? because that's the only part that's actually in the cell. And so if I look at it from that standpoint, the edge of a simple cubic cell is equal to twice the radius of this atom, because you want to think about it, each one of these corners, we can think of that as being the nucleus of the atom. So one radius here, one radius there, that gives us two radii. So we can either draw it up this way, edge is equal to twice the radius, or the radius is half of the edge length for a simple cubic. Now for a face-centered cubic, we're getting this particular formula here, 
Where does that come from? Well, this is where that Pythagorean theorem comes in. If I know the edge length, L, I can see that I can set up a right triangle here where the value of those two legs is L for A and L for B. So if I... L squared plus L squared equals C squared. 2L squared equals C squared. Square root of 2L is equal to C. That's where this value comes from. And if we look closely, we will see that the hypotenuse C would be equal to four times R because I would have one radius here, one radius there, and then the diameter of that sphere in the middle, diameter is two times R. So we've got R, R, and 2R for a total of 4R. So Where does the 0.3536 come from? Well, if I take the square root of two divided by four, I get 0.3536. So on your equation sheet, we don't use the decimal form. We use the square root form. Um, and we try to keep it a little bit simpler than that, just so that you have at least some idea of where that is coming from. Now for body centered, it's a little bit more complicated because the hypotenuse of our triangle is not so easy to come by. We're going through the middle here. So through the middle here, you've got your 4R again because you've got your radius of this one You've got the entire body, so that's 2R. You've got the radius here. So the hypotenuse is 4R again. But the other legs of the triangle are a little bit harder to come by. You've got L, the edge length here. That one's pretty easy. And then to get the other part of the right triangle, you're going to have to make a face And this is where my shortcomings in drawing come in a little bit. Um, it's kind of hard to, to see. But because you're connecting the top, the bottom, the bottom left corner here up to the back top right, um, you can't just come straight down because that wouldn't connect the, the two. So you've got to draw a line from the back top right to the front bottom right so that's across the face of the cube 
Now we've already determined the face of a cube is equal to L square roots of two. So if we do the math, L squared plus L square roots of two squared is equal to C squared. L square roots of two squared would be L squared times two plus L squared. So we end up with three L squared is equal to C squared, which means that the square root of three times L is equal to C, which is equal to four R. And so, The radius is equal to th the square root of three divided by four, which is 0 0.4330. Again, it's, it's a lot easier and we give you the equations that unite radius and edge length. So don't worry about, I, I showed you the math here so that you can see where it came from but you don't have to derive this on your own. All that you need to do is properly identify the unit cell, and then you can use the appropriate equation for that. So kind of the last piece of information that we need before we get into some calculations here is understanding that idea of sharing we can start to get into some ideas of efficiency. And we can see why the face-centered cubic is the most efficient, why we call that the cubic close packing, because if we add up together the eighth of an atom times the eight corners, so there's one atom, plus the half of an atom on each of the six faces, one half times six is three, that means that in total, there are four atoms of that particular substance packed inside of that unit cell. By comparison, the simple cubic only has the one atom because it just has the atoms on the corners. And the body centered only has two atoms because it's got the atoms on the corners plus that one that's trapped in the middle. So we can see that we get double the packing efficiency in face centered compared to body centered and four times that compared to simple. And so the question might be on your mind, well, why don't they all do face centered? And the answer there is relatively simple. They can't. You have to be a certain size for those atoms to fit into those holes that would be necessary for face centered cubic. If you're too big, you have to resort to either body centered or simple, depending upon the size of the atom itself. So just kind of summarizing here, when it comes to the unit cells themselves, If I have a center atom, it's going to give one atom to the unit cell. If I have one on the face, it's going to give half of an atom. If I have one on the edge, a quarter. And if I have one on the corner, one eighth. So when it comes to the packing summaries here, simple cubic will give us one atom for every unit cell.
the relationship between the radius of the atoms that make up the unit cell and its edge length is that the radius is equal to the edge length over two. For body centered, we get two atoms per unit cell. And the relationship between radius and edge length is that the radius is the square root of three divided by four multiplied by the edge length. For face centered, we get the best efficiency, four atoms per unit cell. And the radius is square root of two over four times the edge length. So in terms of what do we see what kinds of crystal structures do we find in metallic substances? We will see that largely, we will see a lot of body-centered cubic kinds of arrangements. We'll see a lot of hexagonal, to be honest. Uh, but again, we're, we're, we're going to kind of dismiss the, that from a calculation standpoint. We understand how it is put together, you know, structurally, but we're going to leave it at that. We will see that polonium is pretty much the only one that is going to adhere to a simple cubic kind of design. Almost everything else is either going to be body centered or face centered. There are a couple of others in there. Um, and we'll, again, we'll just kind of leave those others as, well, other. Um, and we'll kind of leave them at that. The ones here in uh, group 14 that are labeled as diamond structure, um, what we're going to see in those is that they actually make something called a network covalent solid instead, which is what diamond is, where you've got that atom attached in basically a tetrahedral pattern to four other atoms, covalently rather than metallically. Now, from a packing efficiency kind of standard, uh, we can see that hexagonal and face centered have roughly the same packing efficiency and the same coordination number of 12. So from those standpoints, those two types are essentially equivalent to each other. And if we go back and look, most of them fall into that pattern. So if they are of the proper size, they can pack themselves relatively efficiently at 74% in one of those two patterns. With body centered cubic, we will see a coordination number of eight for those. Packing efficiency drops a little bit, 68% instead of 74%. Simple cubic, it drops considerably, going from um, eight down to a coordination number of six. Packing efficiency is 52%, so barely above half of the unit cell is actually full of atom. Almost half of it is empty space. And with that level of inefficiency, you can see why there, there aren't very many cases where we see that kind of unit cell in use. So let's go ahead and stop right here. Let's take a break for about five minutes or so, and we'll get into some common calculations, and then uh, we'll uh, call it a uh, day here from the lecture side.